Yeah, so hello everyone. So yeah, welcome to the seventh edition of this global medical physics education lecture series. So my name is Joe Wiegand and we're gonna be talking about really one of my favorite topics, uh, namely the fundamentals or the physical underpinnings of MRI. So MRI stands for magnetic resonance imaging. This is an imaging modality that was developed in the early 70s by Paul Lauterbur of uh, Stony Brook. The main clinical advantage offered by MRI is that it has excellent soft tissue contrast compared to the other imaging modalities. It can also image in arbitrary planes. And what is very exciting to me is that it has the ability to non-invasively assess some biological processes in vivo, such as diffusion, perfusion, metabolism, et cetera. So before we really get started, let me uh, have a few disclaimers. So MRI is very difficult to understand. So do not be discouraged if you don't understand everything we discussed today. Um, really, MRI is a topic that you need to approach over and over again. And you just really need repetition to just hear it over and over again for things to really sink in. I feel like compared to other imaging modalities like X-ray, CT, ultrasound, PET, nuclear medicine, where you can really explain the main concept of how those work in one or two sentences, although there are many more sort of nuanced details to those imaging modalities, you can really explain the general principle in one or two sentences. With MRI, that is not even close to possible. You'll see we'll speak for an hour today and only then will we really start to understand how an MRI image is formed. Uh, moreover, like some other imaging modalities like CT and ultrasound, uh, MRI is inherently mathematical. So I'm not going to harp too much on the mathematical formulas, but I'm also, since this is a lecture for physicists, I'm not gonna shy away from the mathematics where the mathematics will help explain the concept uh, better. Also, we have a lot to cover. So I'm splitting this up into multiple lectures. So in future months, I will give lectures on, on sort of more advanced MRI topics. But today we're just gonna talk about the physical principles. So some good references. So if you're trying to learn about MRI for the first time, I would recommend uh, Bushberg's The Essential Physics of Medical Imaging. So this book discusses all the medical imaging modalities. But there are two chapters that are associated with MRI, and uh, it, they're a really good introduction to the topic. And if you feel like you have mastered the material in Bushberg's two chapters, and you wanted to delve deeper into some of the more mathematical details of MRI, uh, I would recommend Hakey's book. Uh, if you wanted to study more the mechanics of how to build your own pulse sequence, I would recommend Bernstein's book. Uh, also, uh, Robin de Graff is, uh, he, he writes a book on NMR spectroscopy. Um, this is a specific application, but it does a really good job of explaining the fundamentals of magnetic resonance, although it's specific for spectroscopy. And probably the most important resource is a, a website called MRI Questions. So pretty much any topic in MRI that you wanted to understand, you can just type that topic into MRI questions. It will give you a one or two page brief explanation of the topic. So you start to understand the general idea. And then it will give you sort of links to the relevant literature where you can delve more deeply into the topic if you so desire. But yeah, I use MRI questions all the time whenever I'm trying to understand a new concept in MRI that I haven't came across. So the outline of this lecture, we're going to keep it pretty simple for today, although MRI is not very simple. Um, we're gonna discuss the physical principles, the concepts of image formation, and then magnetic relaxation. So we're gonna have future lectures, as I alluded to, on some of the more clinical aspects and considerations of MRI and also on some of the functional applications of MRI. So using MRI to actually image biology and not just image anatomy. So let's jump into the physical principle. 
of nuclear magnetic resonance. So nuclear magnetic resonance utilizes a property of the universe called nuclear spin. So if you remember from your introductory physics courses, the concept of angular momentum. So spin is kind of like angular momentum, but it is a quantum mechanical property. Uh, it's a property of all particles, but in MRI, we're mainly looking at spins of protons. Uh, that is not entirely true, as we'll discuss when we get to a future lecture on the functional applications. There are times in which you will want to look at the spins of other nuclei, but for the most part, for most clinical applications in MR, we're looking at the spins of protons, specifically protons in water molecules. And they often say that MRI is an inherently insensitive technique, and we'll describe what that means on a future slide, but we're saved by the fact that there are so many protons in the human body, right? We all know the body contains 70% water, and in one cubic millimeter of water, there are on the order of 10 to the 20th protons. So despite the fact that MRI is inherently insensitive, right, we're saved by the fact that there are just so much signal to go around. So in normal conditions, right, these spins that exist in our protons in our body are distributed in an isotropic fashion. So you can think of it as a very tiny magnetic dipole inherent to each proton, right? That's pointing in a given direction. And they're actually pointing in all different directions. They're isotropically distributed. And because there are so many of them, they end up canceling each other out. That's why we don't normally see net magnetic effects when we are in everyday life, right? The magic sort, sort of happens when you place this ensemble of spins in an external magnetic field, because when the ensemble of spins is in an external magnetic field, a given spin will have the tendency to either align with the field or anti-align with the field, right? And if you take the vector sum of the aligning spins and subtract the anti-aligning spins, this creates a net magnetic effect that we call a magnetization. So magnetization is sort of the fundamental uh, entity that we manipulate in magnetic resonance. It is a magnetic polarization density. So the formula for the magnetization is shown here on the left. And the important thing is to note is that the magnetization and hence your sensitivity, how much signal you actually have, is proportional to the strength of the external magnetic field that we place the ensemble of spins in in the first place. Now, it's very important to remember that in MRI, we call this external magnetic field B0. So we are going to refer to it as B0 moving forward. So I think you guys probably should remember that. So a higher magnetic field, you'll have a larger magnetization and hence higher sensitivity. Also, the magnetization is inversely proportional to the temperature. So in MRI, that doesn't help us too much because the temperature of the patient is fixed. However, in in vitro NMR experiments, they actually take a spectrometer and couple it to a cryoprobe that can lower the temperature very, very low, close to absolute zero. And this increases the sensitivity of those in vitro experiments. Now, the fact that the magnetization goes as the external magnetic field divided by the temperature is a statement of Curie's law, which is not named after the very famous uh, Marie Curie, but named after her husband, Pierre Curie. And ultimately, uh, he was doing his work in the 1890s. So Atif, we will address questions at the very end. Um, and at 1.5 Tesla, uh, which is a very clinical uh, field strength, there is a surplus of 4.5 parts per million spins aligned parallel to the field. And what that means is that out of every million spins, there are four and a half more that are aligned with the field than are anti-aligned with 
field. And since the magnetization is taken by taking the difference between the aligned and the anti-aligned spins, that means out of every million spins, we're only getting signal out of four and a half of them. And that is what I say when I say that MRI is inherently insensitive. So we're only working with like four and a half out of a million of the possible signal. Now you can increase that if you increase the field strength of B0, namely if you go to three Tesla or seven Tesla, but still even at those high field strengths, MRI is still insensitive. But as I mentioned, we are saved by the fact that there is so many protons in the human body that even with the insensitivity, we're still able to get a good image. So nuclear spin, as I alluded to, is a fundamentally quantum mechanical property. So a proper mathematical treatment of MR requires the use of quantum mechanics. So you need to construct your Hamiltonian operator, have the Hamiltonian operate on the wave function to determine your energy eigenstates. And the energy eigenstates are essentially the allowed energies of the system. And you can see this in this energy diagram on the left. There are two allowed energy states in MRI. The higher energy state, which corresponds to the spins being anti-aligned with the field, and the lower energy state, which corresponds to the spins being aligned with the field. And luckily for us, there were about 10 or 15 years ago, there was a Danish physicist that published this paper begging the question, is quantum mechanics necessary for understanding magnetic resonance? And basically his argument was, well, to be rigorous and to be proper, yes, quantum mechanics is necessary to treat magnetic resonance, but for the purpose of teaching it and understanding it, you can treat it as purely a classical phenomenon, and that is suffices to, to explain the topic. So moving forward, we are not going to consider quantum mechanics, and we are going to describe MRI from a purely classical perspective. So the first major topic to really understand is called Larmor precession. So as you remember, we place an ensemble of spins in an external magnetic field. This polarizes the spins. That's how we say it. That means it causes them to either align or anti-align with the field. That creates a magnetization that points along the direction of the external magnetic field called the longitudinal axis, taken to be the Z axis or Z axis that goes upward, right? However, the magnetization doesn't exactly point along the longitudinal axis. It actually processes around the longitudinal axis. So we're familiar with the, the process of precession if we were ever as a kid played with a little spinning top or a gyroscope. Uh, so here, precession means that the axis of rotation actually changes in a gyroscope. It revolves around the vertical due to the force of gravity. In a very analogous way, in MRI, the magnetization processes around the external magnetic field. And the frequency at which it processes is what we call the Larmor frequency. Uh, it's very interesting to note that these mathematical details were put in place again in the 1890s by Joseph Larmor, who was actually doing his work 40 to 50 years before they even discovered magnetic resonance. So the Larmor frequency, you must remember, is proportional to the magnetic field. So that is kind of the the key property that actually makes MRI work. And we'll, we'll get into why that is on a future slide. But just remember for now that the frequency, the Larmor frequency is proportional to the magnetic field. So if you have a higher magnetic field, it will the spins will process slightly more fast. If you have a lower magnetic field, they will process slightly more slow. And the constant of proportionality relating the Larmor frequency to the, the magnetic field strength is called the gyromagnetic ratio. It's usually indicated with the Greek letter gamma. Um, the important thing to remember about the gyromagnetic ratio is that it's nucleus dependent. So for each nucleus that we actually look at in MR, it has a different value. And if you're gonna remember one of them, 
I would suggest remembering the gyromagnetic ratio for the proton, which is 42.58 megahertz per Tesla. And the units, as I said, is megahertz per Tesla, right? It converts a field strength in Tesla to a frequency, a Larmor frequency in megahertz. And as you can see in the table, each nucleus has a different value. Some of them are even negative, which just means that it processes in the opposite direction. But the important one to remember, as I said, is the gyromagnetic ratio of the proton, which is 42.58 megahertz per test. So if you remember back to your introductory physics classes, it often behooves you to choose a reference frame or a frame for solving the problem that makes the mathematical details the most simple. And in MRI, the reference frame that makes the mathematical details the most simple is what is called the rotating reference frame, right? We could choose to work in what is called the laboratory reference frame, where we would see the magnetization processing around the external magnetic field, but that makes the mathematics much more difficult. So it's better to work in a reference frame in which is, it is rotating at the Larmor frequency. So in this reference frame, it seems like the, the magnetization is stationary pointing along the longitudinal axis. And the fact that we're working in this reference frame actually has some real world consequences and ultimately le leads to the phenomenon that is known as magnetic resonance. So, so far we polarized an ensemble of spins, created a magnetization, magnetization points along the longitudinal axis. However, if we want to measure the magnetization, we actually need to flip it into the plane that is perpendicular to the longitudinal axis, which we call the transverse plane. And to do this, we introduce an additional magnetic field called an oscillating magnetic field or B1. So you have the external magnetic field B0 and the oscillating magnetic field B1. And there are a few differences between B1 to B0. So firstly, B1 is only applied for a short time on the order of milliseconds where B0 is always there, right? Also, B1 is oscillating at a frequency omega one where B0 is statically pointing in a single direction. And also uh, B1 is, uh, yeah, like I said, applied for just a short amount of time. So, and, it, and it's also very much smaller than the external magnetic field, right? So the idea is that if the frequency of this oscillating field B1 matches the external magnetic fields Larmor frequency omega zero, right? Then you have a condition that is known as resonance or magnetic resonance, right? And this allows us to take the magnetization that's pointing along the longitudinal axis and flip it into the transverse plane, which is what we want to do. And the reason for this is because we are working in that rotating reference frame which is a non-inertial reference frame. So we can understand this if we've ever been to a carnival and rode a ride called the hellhole, right? And if you never, never rode such a ride, what, what it does is that it rotates really fast. And when it starts to rotate really fast, you get stuck to the wall, right? So you're essentially feeling a force to the, radially outward sticking you to the walls. So this is not a real force. It is what is known as a fictitious force. And it arises because we are working in a non-inertial reference frame. In a very analogous way, in MRI, because we're in that rotating reference frame, which is a non-inertial reference frame, we are actually, we, we obtain a fictitious magnetic field that points in the same direction as the external magnetic field, but along the other axis. So in the opposite direction as the external magnetic field. And in the rotating reference field frame, the effective magnetic field is shown by this middle equation, 
And as you can see, the component along the longitudinal axis, if the oscillating uh, frequency equals the Larmor frequency, this Z component will disappear, right? In that case, the effective magnetic field is strictly pointing along the X direction. So it will then rotate or precess around the X direction and rotate from the longitudinal plane into the longitudinal axis into the transverse plane. So basically the angle that we rotate this magnetization is called the flip angle. It's denoted by the Greek letter alpha, and it is essentially the time integral of the B1 field, which remember is only applied for a very short time. So the amount of time that you apply the B1 field is actually dependent on how much you want to flip the, the magnetization. So if you flip it 90 degrees, then all of your longitudinal magnetization is converted into transverse magnetization. And that's good because that's actually how we can generate a signal. So once, in the once we flip the magnetization into the transverse plane, right, we take away the B1 field. So now the effective field is along the direction of the external field again. So it continues or recontinues re to pre process around the external magnetic field. And this processing magnetization being a time dependent changing magnetic field uh, will induce an electromotive force uh, used by Faraday's law of induction. So this is the same concept with how a car engine works uh, by just changing magnetic fields induces a current. So if we were to place a current very close to the, the ensemble of spins that we are manipulating, right? We would actually draw a current in that coil and that current would look something like this. As you can see, it would be a damped sinusoid. So it would be oscillating at a frequency, which you could probably guess is the Larmor frequency. And it would be damped or, or uh, dying out because of relaxation mechanisms, namely T2 relaxation, which we will discuss later. And this uh, curve or, or concept is known as a free induction decay or FID. And it's very important in MRI. Remember, it's just the time dependent current that is uh, induced due to Faraday's law of induction. Uh, because of the processing magnetization in the transverse plane. However, I kind of lied to you. It won't be oscillating at a single frequency, but actually protons, depending on their different chemical environments, will actually see a slightly different magnetic field and will hence oscillate at a slightly different frequency. So, Right, I said most of the protons that we're looking at in MRI come from water molecules. But as you guys are probably well aware, there are other metabolites in our body like creatine, choline, and acetyl aspartate. And the protons in these molecules have a slightly different chemical environment than protons in water molecules. So because of the different chemical environment, the value of the local magnetic field that that proton sees is slightly different than the water molecule. And hence, the Larmor frequency will be slightly different. Therefore, the free induction decay, the FID, will not be oscillating at a single frequency, but it will actually be a superposition of many individual frequency components. And if we were to perform a mathematical operation, on that free induction decay that we'll discuss more in detail, a Fourier transform on a later slide, then we would able to be performing what is called NMR spectroscopy, which is a very, very important technique in chemistry for determining the chemical composition of a given substance. So here, the horizontal axis is chemical shift. Right? It allows us to determine exactly which chemical we're looking at if we're looking at a given peak here. Uh, the vertical axis is signal intensity, and that's proportional to the concentration of that chemical in the region of interest. So say we wanted to find out sort of the metabolic profile in an aggressive brain tumor, for example. 
uh, which, which this is. I think this is, comes from a, a rat brain tumor, actually. So say we wanted to look at the, the profi metabolic profile in a tumor, right? We would put a region of interest in the tumor, right? Then we would collect a free induction decay. We would perform that mathematical technique, the Fourier transform. We would get one of these NMR spectrums. And ultimately, we'd be able to determine the concentration, or at least relative concentration, of each metabolite in the tumor. So it's always helpful to follow the magnetization. When you're trying to understand MRI, always try to think of what the magnetization is doing. So initially, right, we place this ensemble of spins in an external magnetic field. This polarizes the spins and creates a magnetization pointing along the longitudinal axis or the vertical Z axis, right? However, we can only measure the, long, the, the magnetization when it's flipped into the transverse plane. So we apply an oscillating B1 field at the resonance condition to flip the magnetization from the longitudinal axis into the transverse plane. It then processes around the external magnetic field and that draws an electromotor force in a current that is nearby. Once in the transverse plane, it will decay via some relaxation mechanisms, T2 and T1, which we'll explain at the end of the lecture. But these relaxation mechanisms are ultimately how we draw contrast in an MRI. So you might have heard of T2 weighted or T1 weighted images. It's because of these relaxation mechanisms that we'll discuss further. So, okay, all of this is well and good, but I haven't told you anything about how to produce an image, right? A lot of you might be confused. How does all of this uh, magnetization manipulation result in an image? And to understand this, we need to understand a concept known as spatial encoding. And this was sort of the ingenious realization that got Paul Lauterbur his Nobel Prize. And basically it refers to the fact that how we spoke about on the Larmor procession slide, that the frequency of Larmor procession is proportional to the external magnetic field at that location. So in MRI, if we can make each point in space have a slightly different value of the magnetic field, then we will see that given at, a, at each point in space, there will be a slightly different frequency. So by measuring a signal and looking at its frequency and knowing that what that corresponds to a magnetic field and knowing how the magnetic field corresponds to a spatial position, we're able to determine the position in space where that signal comes from, right? This is again called spatial encoding. So here we linearly perturb the magnetic field at each point in space. So referring to the figure here, so say we wanted to image Homer Simpson's brain, right? And to make it simple, let's just consider one direction. So the inferior to superior axis. So going from the cranial caudal axis from Homer Simpson, right? So you would have a slightly smaller magnetic field at the very base of his neck, so in the most inferior part of the image. And as you move superiorly, this gradient magnetic field would cause the magnetic field to grow and grow and grow until you get to the most superior part of Homer Simpson's head where you have the largest magnetic field. And hence, where you are on the inferior to superior axis of Homer Simpson will have a slightly different Larmor frequency. That is how we spatially encode. So we introduce these perturbing magnetic fields that are very small compared to the external magnetic field. And then we determine what frequency that corresponds to. And then when we detect a signal, because of its frequency, we know exactly where in space it comes from. This is the concept that makes MRI image formation possible. It's called spatial encoding. It is done by adding, as I alluded to, these gradient magnetic fields. So these gradient magnetic fields are spatially dependent magnetic fields that change linearly over space, right? It doesn't have to be linear. It just has to be monotonic. But by convention, we use linear gradient magnetic fields. 
So the units of a gradient magnetic field is a millitesla per meter because it's a changing magnetic field, Tesla, over space, meter, right? Typical gradient field strengths are from 15 to 45 milliteslas per meter. Uh, the other major parameter that you discuss when talking about uh, gradient magnetic fields is the slew rate. So basically how fast it can go from zero to its peak amplitude. Um, and this is essentially the peak strength divided by the rise time. So also, if any of you have ever gotten an MRI exam, you know that MRIs are very loud and uh, the, the noise can be quite annoying if you're getting an MRI scan. And the loudness of the MRI scan is due to these gradient magnetic fields that are constantly moving back and forth, switching on and off. Uh, so they make quite a bit of uh, ruckus when, when they're performing a scan. Uh, however, there's a very interesting paper out of Mark Griswold's group at Case Western that actually made the gradient magnetic fields sound like a box symphony. And uh, while the images weren't great, they weren't diagnostic quality, they were still pretty reasonable. So, so maybe we could uh, have patients that are afraid of noises listen to these uh, box symphony uh, gradient magnetic fields. But usually gradient magnetic fields sound very off. So the gradient magnetic fields are produced via this set of gradient coils. So they are three of them, uh, one for each of the principal spatial directions, right? X, Y, and Z. And just to make things complicated in MRI, we don't call it X, Y, and Z, but we call our three directions different things. So our X direction is the frequency encoding or the readout direction. So the gradient magnetic field that is associated with that is the frequency encoding gradient. The Y direction is the phase encoding direction. And the Z direction, which is along the direction of the external magnetic field, so the cranial caudal axis of the patient, that is what we call the slice selection uh, direction or caused by the slice selection gradient. And probably the most complicated topic in MRI, whenever anyone's trying to understand MRI for the first time, they always get confused about K-space and probably rightfully so. So K-space, however, I'm here to de demystify it. It's not as complicated as it sounds, right? It is simply the domain in which we collect data in an MRI experiment, right? It is a spatial frequency domain so it has units one over space, right? It can be either two-dimensional if you're collecting a two-dimensional image or three-dimensional if you're collecting a three-dimensional image, right? And the important thing to note is that it's easily accessible because the parameter K is the time integral of the gradient magnetic field. So basically we can move around in this domain called K space by applying appropriate gradient magnetic fields. Say we want to go to some point in K space that is a little bit to the left and a little bit above. We would apply a gradient magnetic field in the X direction with the appropriate strength to go the amount left that we want to go. And we would apply the gradient magnetic field in the Y direction with the appropriate strength in the, to go the amount we want to go. So basically you can move around K space by applying these gradient magnetic fields. Uh, the spacing between adjacent K space points determines the field of view. So if you wanted to image a larger anatomy of the patient, right, you would actually make K space points be more closely positioned together, right? And also the total extent of K space determines the voxel size, which ultimately determines the spatial resolution of your experiment. So once you collect data in this domain known as K-space, the, the brilliant realization by uh, Ernst, who was at Varian at the time and also at ETH in Zurich, uh, was that all you have to do is take the K-space data and apply a mathematical formula to K-space called a Fourier transform. 
And it's actually an inverse Fourier transform that takes K space to image space, and then a Fourier transform that takes image space back to K space. So the formula for a three-dimensional version of a Fourier transform is shown below. It might look quite complicated, but really it's just one line of code if you're coding in MATLAB or in Python to, to take your K space data and then produce an image. It's really quite trivial once you understand what is happening. And this is ultimately how images are produced. So we collect data in K space, we take an inverse Fourier transform and boom, we get an image. So let's take a deeper look into what K space really represents. So to do that, we need to go all the way back to the 1820s where the French mathematician Joseph Fourier uh, came up with his Fourier's theorem that says that any periodic function can be expressed as an infinite sum of sines and cosines. So as a concrete example, let's say we were trying to uh, reconstruct this original square wave shown in the top left. Well, his theorem says that if we take some number of uh, frequency components with different amplitudes, we can actually start to reconstruct it. So you see right to the right of the original square wave, when you just take three frequency components, you start to get the general shape of the square wave, but it doesn't really look too good. Then you take five components, which is right below that, um, and then it starts to look a little bit better. And then um, if you take 23 components shown towards the bottom left, you see that it really starts to look like a square wave. So you can imagine that if you take an infinite number of components, you will perfectly recapitulate the, the square wave. So then this leads to the concept of spectral analysis where you can take a function and then decompose that function into its frequency components. And as we said in Fourier's theorem, every function can be decomposed into an infinite sum of frequency components, right? And this leads to a concept known as the Fourier transformation, where you take one function and transform it to another function where the one function might be in the time domain, this other function is in the te temporal frequency domain. And you have uh, set pairs of functions that are related re via this uh, Fourier transform. For example, if you have a single sine or cosine wave, now that is oscillating at a single frequency, right? So its Fourier transform would be a spike at that single frequency. Similarly, a sync function uh, would have a Fourier transform that is a rectangular function. And a Gaussian function would have a Fourier transform that is also a Gaussian, but that has a different width, right? So in this way, we're able to sort of seamlessly convert from the time domain to the temporal frequency domain, right? Analogously, although less sort of intuitive, we can convert from the spatial domain, so image space, the actual space of the universe, to the spatial frequency domain, which is what we call K space. And this technique can be easily extended to higher dimensions, two dimensional, three dimensional, which is explicitly what, what we do in MRI because we're producing two dimensional or three dimensional images. So when we talk about K-space, most people think of MRI, but I'm here to tell you that all images have a K-space. The only reason why we talk about K-space in MRI is because the way MRI works, that that is the domain where we actually collect the data. However, even other imaging modalities that aren't collected in K-space, they still have a K-space. So consider this image on the bottom right, where you have a uh, family playing on a beach, a boat in the background, you see the, the sand, the water, the sky. Now this is a quite good image. Um, it's not an MR image, of course, but it still has a case space. So if you were to take this imaging data, like a, a matrix of, of uh, 
signal intensities and perform a Fourier transform, you would get a K space shown to its left on the bottom left, right? Now, there are two sort of major regions in K space. So the center part of K space and then the periphery of K space. So the center part of K space contains what we call low spatial frequency information, which is essentially controlling the, the main general structure of the image. So the center of K space is the most important because it contains the general structure of the image. So you could imagine that if we took this K space, deleted out the periphery, and then inverse Fourier transform back to an image, we would get an image like in the top left. As you can see, we still see the general structure of the image. You can make out the beach and the water and the sky. However, it's too blurry. You don't really have any fine detail. You just see the general structure, but not the fine detail. Analogously, the outer part of K space, the periphery of K space, contains these high spatial frequency information, which contains the, the fine details of the image. So if we were to instead delete out the center of K space, only keep the periphery of K space, uh, inverse Fourier transform into an image, we would get an image on the top right, where here, you see that we see the fine details quite well. You can see the little children playing, the lady walking, the boat in the background. However, you can't really see the general structure of the image. You can't really see the beach or the water or the um, sky at all, right? So really you need all of K space, not just the center of K space, but the periphery of K space as well to produce a very sharp image. So if we go back to K-space, take all of K-space, the center and the periphery, and then inverse Fourier transform back to the image, we would get both the general structure of the image and the fine detail. So we would get the image shown here on the bottom right. So remember that the center of K-space contains the general structure of the image, the periphery of K-space contains the fine details in the image. And if you have all of K-space, you have both. Uh, this point is reiterated on this slide uh, in a medical imaging context where, where here we have an MR image of a phantom. You see, if you only keep the center of K-space, you can see the general structure of the phantom, but it's quite blurry. If you only keep the periphery of the K-space, you don't really even see the structure of the phantom, but you do see the uh, fine details of the phantom. And moreover, if you have all of K-space, you have all of it. You have the general structure of the image and the fine details of the image. I must point out that K-space is not, it's not like you have a single number at each point in K-space, but it's actually a complex valued function. So you have a real part and an imaginary part or analogously, uh, magnitude part and a phase part. And ultimately, uh, when we are looking at an image, typically we look at magnitude images. So we just kind of get rid of the phase information. But that's not always the case. Actually, in some of the functional applications that I'll explain in a future lecture, you do want that phase information to actually learn something about the biology of the patient as well, not just the anatomy. Um, but ultimately, usually we use magnitude images. So to summarize for K-space, uh, so K-space is just the domain where we collect data in MRI. It's a spatial frequency domain. It's not as complicated as it sounds. And we can move around K-space by applying gradient magnetic fields. Remember, if you apply a gradient magnetic field, you start to move in K-space in the direction of that gradient. You then sample K-space or collect the data in K-space and then apply either a two-dimensional or three-dimensional inverse Fourier transform to obtain the image. So we can now understand really all the components of an MRI scanner. Obviously you have the table that can move in or out uh, where the patient will be laying. 
you have the external magnetic field shown here as magnet. Uh, remember, this is the B0 field, which polarizes the spins and creates the magnetization. You have the gradient coils, which remember are used for spatial encoding and actually help you uh, produce an image. And you have the radio frequency coils, which have two purposes. One, they generate the oscillating magnetic field B1, which flips the magnetization from the transverse plane into, sorry, from the longitudinal axis into the transverse plane. And also the radio frequency coils when in receive mode, will uh, detect the signal that comes out of the patient that we ultimately use to make an image. So the last topic we're gonna discuss today is that of magnetic relaxation. So this is the relaxation mechanisms that we have spoken about. So yeah, here uh, T1 relaxation is uh, known as spin lattice relaxation. So remember, we have the longitudinal magnetization, we flip it into the transverse plane. So at that point that we flip it, all the magnetization is in the transverse plane. T1 relaxation describes it slowly starting to grow back along the longitudinal axis. So it's the recovery of this longitudinal magnetization. And the recovery is shown uh, in the figure on the right. As you can see, it's exponential growth or regrowth um, and it's tissue dependent. So each uh, tissue in our body will have a different T1 value and this is caused by molecular tumbling. And ultimately, the, the interesting thing is that T1s of different tissues are wildly different. Unlike in CT, for example, where their contrast is generated on the physical density, right? In MRI, we're generating contrast based off these T1, T2 properties, these magnetic properties of tissue. And they are wildly different, unlike in CT, where physically dense, physical densities of tissues are more or less the same, you know? Um, so ultimately, T1 is defined as the time it takes to go from zero longitudinal magnetization after you flip the magnetization in the transverse plane to grow back to 63% of its peak value. And ultimately, as I alluded to, this is how we produce a T1 weighted image. We'll describe that in more detail in a future lecture, however. T2 relaxation describes not the regrowth of the longitudinal magnetization, but the decay of the transverse magnetization. So you take the longitudinal magnetization, you flip it into the transverse plane, and initially all of those spins are in phase. So the magnetization is as big as it possibly can be. However, as time goes about, these spins start to interact with each other. That's why it's called spin-spin relaxation and they start to dephase or decohere. And this causes the transverse magnetization to decrease in magnitude. And T2 is defined as the time it takes to go from 100% because you start with full transverse magnetization all the way to, down to 37% of your signal. Again, T2 is tissue dependent, which is quite helpful because that's how we're able to produce T2 images. Um, however, um, usually when we're measuring T2, we're not actually measuring T2, but we're measuring a surrogate for T2 known as T2 star. And T2 star accounts for both T2 decay that I just described, and also sort of imperfections in our measurement technique. So everything I've said so far has assumed that this external magnetic field B0 is perfectly homogeneous in space. However, there will be slight local inhomogeneities that will cause even more rapid T2 dephasing than with regular just spin-spin interactions. So ultimately, we don't measure T2, we measure T2 star. And if you look at the bottom left, you see the relationship between T2 star and T2, and T2 star, depending on T2, 
and on delta B, which is the local magnetic field in homogeneity. So actually on the FID free induction decay slide, when I say that uh, FIDs decay by T2, I actually lie to you guys, they decay by T2 star. But in a perfect world, if we were to have a perfectly homogeneous uh, external magnetic field, T2 and T2 star will be the same thing. But in general, T2 star is shorter than T2 because it induces more rapid dephasing. Uh, one can just look up in the literature values of T1s and T2s. Uh, the one thing to note is that T1 depends on field strength. So if you have a 0 0.5 Tesla magnet and a 1.5 Tesla magnet, you will have different T1 values. However, T2 uh, is roughly independent of field strength. So regardless of what field strength you're working at, your T2 shouldn't really change. So now we pretty much have everything to put together sort of the classical formulas that describe the time evolution of the magnetization in magnetic resonance. And these equations are known as the Bloch equations. They were written down by Felix Bloch of Stanford University. They are a set of coupled uh, partial differential equations, which describe a magnetic moment evolving in a magnetic field. But then you also add in these relaxation mechanisms, T1 and T2. So this set of three equations describes the entire system of MRI. Um, and ultimately these equations were then modified to account for different biological processes, such as diffusion of water molecules or the chemical exchange of protons by Toria McConnell. And also, uh, very interestingly, Richard Feynman, if you guys have heard of Richard Feynman, he actually was able to show that uh, a physical system where you had an atomic beam traveling through a vacuum and interacting with a pair of counterpropagating lasers, right? This system is mathematically equivalent to magnetic resonance. So he was able to describe this system via what he called the optical block equations because it was the block equations applied to his optical system. So yeah, in summary, uh, Again, MRI is very complicated. So that's why I try to repeat these things over and over again. So you take an external magnetic field B0, you place the spins of the patient in that external magnetic field that will polarize the spins. Then you add uh, an oscillating field B1, which will flip the magnetization into the transverse plane. You have gradients that are there to perturb the magnetic field and perform spatial encoding by, by allowing us to know the exact, the, the frequency at each, <clears throat> where each signal comes from, and then how that corresponds to the magnetic field and how each magnetic field, each point in space has a unique value of magnetic field. This is the concept of spatial encoding. The data in MRI is collected in this domain called K-space. And then you, once you collect K-space, you just perform this mathematical formula on it called an inverse Fourier transform, and you get an image. Um, and there are also these T1 and T2 relaxation processes where uh, there is decay and regrowth of the magnetization. And ultimately, in a future lecture, we're going to describe how we can exploit T1 and T2 relaxation to generate contrast in an image. So with that, I wanted to thank you guys for your attention. I, I hope I made it as understandable as possible. Again, MRI is a quite complicated uh, process. So uh, yeah, you just have to listen to it over and over again, and it will eventually seep in. That is all I've got.